Welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Crean Butler, uh, and I'm the director of the Global Economy and Finance Programme at Chatham House. And it's my great pleasure today to host a discussion with Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweila, who is a candidate for the position of Director General uh, of the WTO. This is the first in a series of such discussions that Chatham House is hosting with the WTO candidates. And I'm very pleased that this forms part of a Chatham House's centenary celebrations. Uh, in its first 100 years, the Institute has been a strong and committed supporter of the rules-based international system. And we hope that these discussions on the future leadership of the WTO can contribute in a small way to strengthening an absolutely critical part of that system. Dr. Ngozi has been uh, generally with an enormously distinguished career in both economic policy and international affairs. Uh, she has twice served as finance minister of Nigeria, and she has also served as managing director for operations at the World Bank. Uh, she has a very wide range of current goals and roles, but I would particularly highlight her position as chair of the board of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and also she is the African Union Special Envoy to mobilize international financial support for the fight against COVID-19. Before we begin, I'd just like to make a few quick housekeeping points. Uh, this webinar is on the record and will be recorded. And if you wish to tweet, uh, please use the hashtag CHEvents. After an initial discussion of 20 minutes or so, uh, we will move uh, to a Q&A segment. And if you would like to ask a question, please submit it through the Q&A function, uh, not the raised hand function or the chat function. Uh, and if time allows, uh, we will also ask some of the participants to pose their questions directly to Dr. Ngozi. So please clearly indicate your affiliation and also if you are happy to be asked to put your question directly. Uh, please also keep your questions as brief and to the point as possible as we have uh, a very limited time and we'll have a hard stop at uh, six o'clock, 1800 hours. Uh, Dr. Ngozi, thank you so much for sparing the time uh, to be with us today. And perhaps I could start our discussion by asking you about your overarching philosophy on global trade. It's clear from the statements that you made to the WTO Council and your press conference that you're a strong supporter. But what does this mean in practice and how does it influence your vision for the future of the WTO? Well, first of all, Creon, thank you so much and, and good day to everybody wherever you are in the world. Congratulations on the centenary of uh, Chatham House. Well, my overarching philosophy on this is to have a truly dynamic trading system, a multilateral trading system, which is responsive to the challenges of the 20, 21st century. You know, a trading, multilateral trading system that is proactive looks ahead, uh, you know, devices rules uh, that, that, take, that take care of current and future issues. Instead of being reactive, it shouldn't follow, it should lead uh, the way and create conditions which foster trade for the benefits of all countries. My philosophy is a, is a, is a trading system, a dynamic trading system that is inclusive because um, you know that trade has lifted up the lives of hundreds and of millions of people. But there are those who have been left behind and not included. We need a new trading system that uh, in, encompasses the, the, the vulnerable and, and those marginalized uh, women and trade uh, issues uh, uh, that I, I'm very interested in, micro, small and medium enterprise and trade. So an inclusive trading system. So let me leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, one of, one of your very clear strengths in your CV is your experience operating at the highest political level. Um, but at the same time, uh, when you look at the political environment facing the WTO today, um, it's arguably the most difficult um, environment that it's ever faced. I mean, we have growing tensions between the two largest economies. Uh, there are the, the, the immediate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. But also you have uh, both in advanced countries and in developing countries, many, be, many people are kind of questioning um, the balance between the benefits of free trade, but also the costs. So the key question is, you know, there's a need for political um, leadership 
and how how would you go about creating the political consensus necessary to deliver on your vision as you've described it up to now? Thank you, Creon. I think this is a, a you know a really important issue. But I always hasten to say that when we look at the political issues of to, of today uh, between the big powers or between developed and developing countries, we should separate out some political issues that are not really in the arena of trade, but may be confounded with it. Uh, so if you focus on those issues of trade and, and WTO and what needs to be done, I do think that you know, my approach would be to focus on areas of agreement. Very often we focus on areas of disagreement and spend so much time on that, that we do not notice that there are some intersecting circles where countries actually do agree. For instance, you know, the, both the United States and, and China are involved in the fisheries negotiations now, which is a multilateral negotiations, they're both in it. And you know, it's proceeding relatively well. So it's not that they are always falling out or always in disagreement. There are areas where they agree. And my approach to dealing with that would be to find those areas, even when it seems they are disagreeing. I've noticed in talking to members, there are some common uh, elements that come in. So that's my approach to life. Focus on the, uh, the positives, build up from that. Obviously trust is a huge issue. How do you now have the wins that will enable you to build trust between the two? Um, and I think that both the US and China have benefited immensely from an, an open, uh, stable, predictable, fair, multilateral trading system. And uh, they are developing countries and least developed who would like to benefit also. And I think there's a win-win for us in that. Yeah. Clearly, um, I mean, I think the way, the way you describe it in terms of sort of selecting a key area where there's a potential for agreement pushing forward with that and then developing trusts on that basis and, and expanding, if you like, the area of negotiations. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And I guess to some extent, um, the current uh, Director General, you know, approached it in, in terms of um, the trade facilitation agreement. It was an example of picking out an area where there was an agreement that was achieved. But at the same time, you know, supposedly one of the great benefits of big multinational negotiations is that you enable trade-offs to take place between different areas. And also, if you don't have a sufficiently broad range uh, of issues, uh, you know, one group of countries or country may hold hostage, um, you know, agreement on one thing, which they actually might agree to, but until they get something in somewhere else. And so while I can see your, your strategy, and it makes a lot of sense, I mean, how, how are you going to deal with that sort of broader context, um, which, which can frustrate um, that approach? Well, you know, let's take one specific area where this is a very big difficulty in agricultural negotiations, yeah. the issue of domestic support, where you have, you know, some developing countries who feel that they don't really want to discuss anything until you, you get rid of the aggregate measurement of support beyond the minimis. And that's their position, they're sticking to that. Uh, and then the developed countries who feel that Article 6.2 does give developing countries the ability to, you know, subsidize inputs or resource for farmers and that this also uh, gives them room. And that the de minimis of several countries, they have their agricultural systems are so large now that when you calculate that it's huge sums of money. And, and each side is saying, unless this happens, I won't do this. You know, we, won't, we, won't, uh, we want market access, but unless you do this, you know, we won't discuss, you want market access, but unless you do this, we won't discuss it with you. So my approach there really is to step back, to step back and say, let us all put all issues of domestic support on the table. Let us not have red lines. Let's not have linkages, you know, that say we won't do this and, and we wouldn't do that. And step back afresh, because that issue has really been holding up a lot of negotiations. So I would, I would, on that one, I would start from ground zero in a way on domestic support and see how we craft something that is acceptable and balances the rights and obligations of each member according to their development. So that's the way I would approach that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, you, you as um, a, a former finance minister of Nigeria and so on, have experience of the, the, the G20 and, if you like, the role that the G20 has played 
since 2010 in um, overseeing, if you like, the, the global economic system. And um, when one's looking at that sort of challenge of how do you achieve political will, um, I guess in many people's mind is the, the idea that somehow the G20, whether through leaders or finance ministers, trade ministers, can play an important role in creating a context in which the WTO can move forward. I mean, do you think uh, that it is helpful, um, can be helpful? And if so, how can you make it helpful? Or, you know, as some trade ministers have said in the past, actually, we don't want we don't want the G20 anywhere near what we're doing because they don't really understand um, trade uh, discussions and so on. So better for them to keep away. I mean, what's your view of the role of the G20 in this respect? Well, you know, I, I don't blame, I mean, you know, trade ministers will always look on finance ministers in a certain way and maybe finance ministers on trade, but really there's that division. For me as a development economist, my entire career is really an artificial one. Uh, because, you know, when you're in development e economics, trade is part and parcel of what you learn, do, live with. And I always tell people, you know, they say you're in finance. I'll just use this opportunity to say a word on, on that before I talk on the G20. When you're in a development economist, you have to deal with trade. This is one of the tools, a means to an end of improving people's lives. So I've been doing that all my life, you know, do, working on trade policy issues, even as finance minister. I had customs reporting to me and therefore that was all about trade facilitation. So, so that familiarity with those issues, I don't think we should make this division. I think the two professions or two sets of ministers should work together. And I did that with my trade minister and it went very well when we were negotiating the ECOWAS common external tar tariffs. But coming to your issue, um, you know, so for that reason, I don't think it's out of place for the G20 uh, they actually have a trade group, a working group on trade. And they recently released something about uh, reforms for the WTO. And my thought to that was, well, the WTO had better, you know, step in and start doing its own reforms quickly before it has it done to it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that the trade group and the G20 cannot provide a context. Why is that important? Because many of the same players uh, who are having issues of trust and so are also members of the G20. And there could be, that could be a forum to try and uh, leverage to solve some of those issues. So I'm not necessarily against it. I do think the trade ministers should be in charge of, you know, seeing that those reforms are carried out and the members, uh, not necessarily the G20. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to put one further question before we move to uh, Q&A from the audience. Um, and uh, it's essentially around your, uh, your case for being uh, the leader of the WTO. Um, I mean, I think in, in many of the interactions you've had um, with the media, but also with the WTO Council, you've emphasized the importance of selecting uh, a candidate who, who is the best candidate on the basis of merit. And uh, I mean, one can see from your CV an enormous amount of experience. Um, I mean, my question really is what, what do you think are the most important elements from your, from your career to date? Um, but also if you are successful, you will be um, the first person from the African continent to lead this uh, important organization. Um, you'll also be the first woman to lead the organization. And although, you know, merit is the right criterion, uh, how do you think these two attributes will be able to help you um, in making a success of uh, leadership of the WTO? Thank you. I think that's a very important uh, question. I think the WTO is, a, is at a very difficult juncture right now where there's so many challenges and there's paralysis in the system. Um, and, and therefore it needs a certain kind of leadership. That's why I say it should be on merit. And I mean it most sincerely, of course, in saying that I think I should be the one that I, 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 I can do it. But the reason it's important to me to focus first on who can lead is because it is clear to many people that if the WTO gets wrong, gets it wrong in terms of leadership this time, it will continue more into irrelevance. And to me, it's too important an institution to have that label that it's on the sidelines. And I do think that um, they have to try something different. Uh, you, you need, you know, it's no longer just, you need the trade uh, uh, skills and qualifications, but you also need the ability to break through some of the things that are 
paralyzing the system. You need the, the strong political credentials. You need reform credentials. I'm not talking about, I know how to do reform. You need people who've actually delivered reform. And I've done that, not only at the World Bank, but in my country. I wrote a book about it called Reforming the Unreformable. Uh, I've done it and it's tough. It's not easy. It's not something you talk about. So, so that is why the leadership of the WTO matters now. Now, if you add to that, that look, an African is there, why not? We have talented people on the continent. We have three candidates now. Some people are questioning why I have respect for my competitors. You know, I think my continent bringing three people forward is not so bad. You know, it means we have riches of people who are capable. If you're a woman, so, so much the better. But for me, I don't think we want to turn the criteria up, you know, the other way. Have married first, and if that person happens to be a woman, great. If they happens to be an African, great. And for me, I fit the bill on all fronts. I think if the WTO continues doing what it's been doing, uh, talking only about technical expertise, I respect technical, you need it, and I have what it, it is needed. But you need something beyond that. You need long experience, managing in multilateral. So you need the political clout. You need the ability to reach where decisions are made. But most of all, you need boldness, courage, reforms need to be done. Thank you very much. Um, I'm go now going to uh, ask some of the many questioners who put questions um, in the question box to, to ask their questions. And let's hope that this works properly. But I'd like to go to uh, Peter Ungpa, Pargon initially, who has a question about the, uh, the appellate body. Um, so I hope we can unmute him and allow him to ask his question. Let's see if that works. Peter, are you able to speak? Okay. Peter? Yes, please. You've please got go me. Ahead. Yes, I've got you. Dr. Ngozi, the appellate body crisis is one of the most serious problems facing the WTO. Do you think Ambassador David Walker's proposals are a realistic solution? And how would you persuade the US to move from simply criticizing the appeals process to making proposals and actually joining in the search for a solution? I'm a former WTO Secretariat staff. Yes, that's a very, that's the key question. And I, I totally share what I say about the appellate body and the whole dispute settlement system is that, look, it, it's the, what, the most critical or one of the most critical things because you cannot have a rules-based system where there is no forum to resolve disputes and issues. That makes the system over time lose credibility. So the, the need to, to deal with this issue of the dispute settlement system and the appellate body is critical. Now, I think the Walker process has uh, uh, merit. If you look at some of the things that Ambassador Walker has uh, uh, proposed or is proposing, they respond to a lot of the issues raised by uh, the Americans, which have legitimacy. I think if you look at some of them, I, I hasten to say that some of them have a footing. And I think we need to listen and understand the frustrations from the American side. Now, the issue of uh, um, the appellate body not going be, be beyond the covered agreements that members have entered into beyond its mandate uh, is one that should be looked at. And, and um, in, in the Walker process, I think there's a, a, a look at that. Uh, the issue of the num amount of time it takes, the 90 days uh, uh, that going beyond that in order to uh, come to a resolution of, of issues or disputes that's also a legitimate issue. I mean, issues are now complex that come before the appellate body and it may take some time, but I think there's room to discuss how do we adjust for that. So I think the Walker process has good elements. I think we, the, the, that there's room to marry what they're, they're, is being done there with what the Americans are saying. Actually, if you talk to the Americans, they say, look, the system as was put together is not broke. We don't need a new system. Let's just implement what we have now, that the problem is it's not being implemented. So since much of that philosophy also fits with what Ambassador Walker's process is trying to put together, I think we can come to a meeting of, of minds on how this dispute settlement uh, system should be amended. 
And mark you, one of the things I'd like to see in rejigging it or reforming it or you know, strengthening it to do what it's supposed to do is also to take account of the, of the structural issues that prevent many developing countries, the least developed countries in particular, for having access. If you look at the settlement of disputes, you see many of these countries, yes, they're a small part of the multilateral trading system, but they hardly ever use this dispute settlement system because there are barriers, they don't have the capacity, the wherewithal to do it. So we need to also fix that. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to go now for, to a question by Catherine McKenzie. Uh, can we un, unmute Catherine McKenzie, please? Hello. Hello, yep, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, yes, I wanted to ask about the role of labor, uh, labor standards and labor organizations. How do you see that, particularly because you were talking about those left behind um, by the global trading system and also about um, you know, the costs and benefits and achieving a, a recognized balance between costs and benefits. So I wondered how you see labor being involved in trade discussions going forward. I think that the issue of labor standards uh, is, is very important um, uh, and uh, that we need uh, in integrating that because that could also be one of the measures that um, perhaps can lead to distortion, to anti, uh, can damage competition uh, uh, between countries and between companies uh, and, and, um, and lead to trade distorting, if you will. Uh, um, uh, things that trade distorting environment. So um, you would, it, it, I think working with the ILO would be very important. Uh, with WTO trying to work with the ILO to make sure that labor standards are respected and, and that uh, the trading system is not an end in itself, but it's meant to work for people. Uh, so it should work for labor. It should work for those marginalized. Uh, and, and that's the way uh, I see it. Um, so that notwithstanding, um, I, I think we really need to look at labor situations in our countries which are differing. As long as there's no attempt to be anti-competitive in the way that labor is utilized uh, or labor is, uh, uh, does its role, um, then I think, I think it's, it's, um, that's okay, you know. Um, but we need to avoid everything that damages competition and damages the multilateral tr trading system. So I, I totally agree on standards. Perhaps I could use that as an opportunity to, to ask a broader question, which is um, very often to get the best outcome from uh, a trade negotiation, countries not only need to participate in that negotiation and press for their own uh, key interests, but they also need to, to undertake domestic policies and domestic actions, which complement, if you like, the, 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 the freer trade that may follow from the, from the negotiation. And certainly when you look at some of the critiques of trade liberalization in the past, quite often you can attribute it um, for some countries to the fact they just haven't done domestic actions that were, would have actually enabled them to benefit. So it, in a way, you, the WTO doesn't control those domestic actions, and yet they're so important. Um, from your experience as a finance minister, I mean, how do you think uh, the WTO can influence the overall package, if you like, not just the trade negotiation, but the domestic, um, the domestic action as well? I think that's a very important question and issue, Creon, because uh, if you look at the African continent, for example, uh, we have a very small share of world trade, which has actually fallen from 5% to 3% and stagnating around there. And intra-African trade itself is 15%. So, you know, so all around, we, we are not benefiting as much or the continent is not benefiting as much from the multilateral trading system or even intra-Africa trade. And so this new African continental free trade agreement uh, is the beginning. But to benefit, you need to have goods to sell. And taking my continent as an example, we have to add value to products in order to, to, to have what to export and to sell to each other. So we need to start interrogating ourselves about 
how do we add value? And these are behind the borders, you say domestic issues. How do we process the primary commodities that we keep exporting and we've been doing over time? And what does the, you know, uh, uh, um, what, what does it, what is the world trading system saying about that? Are we facing, for instance, uh, escalation, tariff escalation, you know, when you add value, you meet increasingly higher tariffs. How do we deal with that? The WTO can contribute to tariff preferences, which exist in any case uh, uh, for least developed countries uh, that can enable countries to add value and to trade more. So I certainly agree with that. And that adding value behind the borders needs investment, uh, you know, policies that are friendly to investment, both domestic investment as well as external. And once you do that, then you look at the trading system and say, if you're at least, at least developed country, do you have uh, um, preferences like AGOA, uh, everything but arms uh, of the EU and so on. There are some systems that we can benefit from. So I think, and those are compatible with the WTO. So I think in that way, we can find systems where the WTO can buttress what countries are trying to do so they can take better advantage. Thank you very much. We have uh, a number of questions from, from uh, an African perspective, and I'd like to bring in one of those uh, now, maybe some others as well. And um, I would uh, like to ask if we could unmute for Vivian Ikwezu, and I apologize if I've not pronounced your name correctly. Perhaps we could do that now, uh, Vivian. Vivian, can you, can you speak? If not, maybe what I'll do is read the question. Um, uh, the can... question shall we go? No, please go ahead. Sorry, Sorry I was saying it's Vivian Ihekwazu from Nigeria. Yeah, I was please go ahead. Dr. Uh, Okonjo Iwala, um, as you just mentioned, the African um, continental free trade area was finally signed um, in March 2018 by our heads of state, with Nigeria finally coming on board in July 2019. So as the prospective director general of the, of the WHO, what quick wins are in place to strengthen our regional economic communities in Africa, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, where there is a clamor to look inwards? Okay, well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ihekwazu. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, I think there are a couple of parts uh, to that question. Um, First of all, as Director General, I think the way that the uh, a AFCTFA has been negotiated is quite compatible with WTO rules. And, and so what I would be doing uh, is looking for what instruments uh, that at the disposal of the WTO could we use to help buttress uh, you know, what we're trying, what the continent is trying to achieve. You have aid for trade, uh, for instance, uh, which could be used uh, not only to do analysis for countries, to find out what do they really need to do in order to benefit more from both trading system within the continent as well as outside, and then acting upon that, you know, resources to help strengthen and build capacity for trade. The WTO has many programs that it's had over time that I think we can take advantage of even more. I would also uh, uh, look to the other multilateral development institutions because, because some of what we have to take care of needs resources. And the WTO, even though it has aid for trade, is not really a funding institution. So how do you collaborate with the, with the World Bank, with the African Development Bank uh, uh, to, to try to deal with some of the behind the border issues we need to solve? Let's take the digital divide, for instance. The idea that we have you know, electronic commerce coming up. One of the areas the WTO, uh, some negotiations are going on and, and WTO has to come up with new rules. How do we benefit if we don't have the connectivity? Those are the things we'd be looking at, you know, to see how can WTO help work with other institutions to solve uh, uh, some of those uh, problems. Uh, um, so that is, um, I think essentially some of the things I would be looking at. I just want to repeat, that we can have a free trade agreement or a free trade area. But if we do not solve some of the problems that stop us from participating in trade, i.e. adding value to our products, that's an issue. On the issue of COVID, 
uh, that was the second thing you mentioned. This is an area in which actually I'm right in the middle because I'm also WHO and an envoy to the Tools Accelerator, which is uh, a program to accelerate uh, the vaccines, production of vaccine therapeutics and diagnostics and, and allocate in a way that developing countries can benefit. In the short term, we want the multilateral trading system to make, allow this to happen, to make sure there are no restrictions that prevent our, our countries on the continent from accessing supplies. You know, this has been the case. There have been restrictions, poorer countries have not been able to get access. So lifting that in the longer term, I think all over the world, we're inevitably going to see a shift in attitude, perhaps from just in time to just in case or just at home. And Africa is going to be some part of that, but I don't think it's going to be overwhelming. So we will be able to do some of our own products since we import 94% of our pharmaceuticals, but that does not remove from the need to have free liberalized trade in these, in these areas so that those who cannot manufacture or who cannot uh, do so at scale can have access to a multilateral trading system uh, that, that, that allows them to get uh, their medical supplies, their vaccines, their equipment that they need uh, in, in, in a fair and equitable manner. Perhaps I could um, follow on that question, which is, I mean, many of the things you've covered are what, what people are talking about in terms of the new normal that will follow the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think you've given some good examples in relation to Africa. Um, but in terms of the broader range of issues that, and, and in terms of the way the global economy is going to, to, uh, to evolve, do you think it, it's helpful for the WTO in a way to have a, a new normal package of some kind and you know, group all these things together and say, look, obviously we have a role in terms of the immediate response to the COVID pandemic crisis, but also this is a package of things that we can do. And would that be a way of perhaps building political momentum? Or do you think in a way people will say, well, hang, about, hang on a second, what about the things that really matter now? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think it's both. I, I think, you know, I'm totally convinced that the issue of COVID and trade uh, will be very topical, let's say at the next ministerial, which is the middle of uh, next year. And the WTO should prepare, members should prepare to have conversations that move the issue along because new rules need to be agreed on how to deal with this and then not just for now but for the next pandemic so that will be very topical but in addition to that when i say to, that the rules of the wto need updating to the 21st century i'm thinking precisely of those bundles of new economy areas if you want to call them that uh, you know the circular economy the green economy the digital economy, yes, that those should be bundled. And in a way, you know, I'd, I'd like to, I, I wish we could do multilateral negotiations on this. Some are moving along under plurilateral negotiations, uh, joint statement initiatives. Uh, of course, multilateral is the best because it, it saves transactions costs. It, it, you know, it allows everybody in. But we are moving some of these issues, and I think those bundle of issues should be looked at. Actually, if we don't do that, uh, the WTO will continue to lag further and further behind. If you look at some of the regional uh, uh, agreements, uh, free trade areas uh, 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 that have been negotiated, and regional agreements, uh, negotiations uh, resulted in some good agreements that do, um, they, they touch on some of these cutting edge issues. And I think the WTO also ought to be going uh, in that direction. Now, let me also say that uh, there are some, what I call 20th century issues left over uh, from the Doha development agenda. And you know, there's a lot of sore feelings about those issues. There are some members who feel we are past that, we should move only to the new issues. But there are also many members who feel like, look, there were specific mandates to negotiate some of these on the agricultural side, the public stock holding, the special safeguard mechanism, the cotton, you know, and there's uh, merit in also looking at those and seeing how the WTO can deal with these issues, as even as it looks at the 21st century. So you're going to need a much bigger WTO <laughs> secretariat, I think, to cope with all of this. But, by the um, way, uh, by the way, I think the WTO should be looking also at issues of women and trade. 
micro, medium, and small enterprises, these are all 21st century issues too. Maybe they are 20th, but they're certainly 21st. Indeed. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, another um, question, please. Uh, if we could unmute Pierre Sauvé. Um, and I think he has a question on um, the, the issue of fiscal support and uh, it's linked to new sustainable forms of production. So Pierre, could you ask your question, please? Can you yeah, hear me? Good. Yes, we can, please go ahead. My question to Dr. Ngozi concerns the unprecedented um, sort of fiscal response to the COVID situation, which um, of course, <laughs> to accelerate the pace of recovery. And for many people, this opens up genuine opportunities to actually engage in the kinds of reforms that she just mentioned, uh, particularly regarded to the green economy, uh, to promote more sustainable patterns of production and trade and consumption. And of course, there's a role for trade in this, but where do you see uh, the WTO and trade rulemaking and trade negotiations fitting in to a greening of the world economy. Well, th thank you uh, very much. Um, I, again, in two parts. Um, I, I think that the WTO and the multilateral trading system should be looking at issues of sustainability, of which environmental issues and greening issues are very much uh, um, a, a part of that. And, and looking at what rules would be supportive at least not impeding. Uh, for instance, I want to take the fisheries negotiations. This is one that is not only, that will lead to more sustainable fisheries, that will lead to uh, better uh, uh, attention to biodiversity in our seas. So it's that kind of a thing, negotiating away harmful subsidies and, and you know, looking to see that those only subsidies that do no harm are in place. So the same with the green or climate change. You have to uh, look at the issue of, you know, do we have uh, um, within our trading system or set, uh, areas where there are actually subsidies that are harmful uh, uh, to, to the environment that do not contribute to sustainability? And then how do you deal with those harmful subsidies? So that, that is uh, one approach. Um, but coming back to your issue of, uh, of the fiscal stimulus, um, you know, I said in my speech, the fiscal stimulus is needed. There have been massive amounts of it, trillions of dollars in the, in the developed economies, and that's appropriate in order to, to speed up the recovery, to provide safety nets for those uh, who, who need it. Uh, of course, the developing countries and the poor countries have not been able to issue that kind of stimulus. So the question is, how is this stimulus being used? And I believe strongly what you said that it can be used in a way that will lead to a more, to more sustainable patterns of production, of living, uh, uh, um, uh, that you, you, so that these resources are used to, as they say, build back better. You, you don't want to use them to go back to the old way of doing things. So I totally believe in the fact that we should focus all the resources we are do, right, that are being put in the system now to more sustainable, approaches uh, to production, greening production, uh, backing away in our industrial uh, uh, system from damaging use of, uh, you know, of um, in some cases, fossil fuels, coals and so coal, uh, things that damage the environment. So how do we build back better using this? I think that's a very good uh, and topical issue and that the trading system can work in a way, WTO rules can, work in a way that that sustains that without impeding the national treatment principle or the MFM principle. I think we can we can do that. The other the last thing sorry the last thing I want to, to, to say about that is that the this massive amounts of money should not restore uh, re, uh, should not end up indirectly uh, into subsidies uh, or other forms of use that also distort, damage competition or distort the trading system. So how we implement this fiscal stimulus is indeed very important. 
Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, six minutes or so, so I'll try and fit in as many questions as we can, as I know you have to leave at, at six o'clock. Perhaps I could uh, ask if we could open up uh, and unmute Alan Beatty uh, from the Financial Times, who has a question, please. Alan, go ahead. <clears throat> Alan Beatty here. Um, it was Pascal Lamy, I think, who, dis who described the WTO's consensus form of um, decision making as medieval. Um, and apart from plurilaterals, which don't seem to have produced a huge amount, I haven't seen many suggestions about how the decision-making process for negotiations could be updated. Do you think we can still stick with the consensus model, or, or do you think there's something more, sort of more modern and swifter and more effective that we can move to? Thank you, Alan. I mean, that is one of the critical questions uh, that, that comes up. And of course, the consensus model is uh, uh, more difficult uh, in, in a way to do. It would be quite easy to have a system in which a small group or some executive board or something made decisions. But I think we have to think back to, to the reasons for the consensus uh, uh, system and to remind ourselves that this worked in the past and to ask ourselves, why is it not working? The reason why I'm not rushing to alternatives, but trying to see how can we make it work in the way it did before is because the consensus system means that the, it, the, what, what, whatever agreements are arrived at will be implemented by all the members who participated, the 164 members. If you have another system in which a group takes decisions, not everybody shares in it, then you re run the risk of members not implementing that. Uh, and that would cause even more problems uh, than, than, uh, than you can imagine. So I come back to the point, what is it that has happened that has made this consensus system? People are describing it, maybe Pascal as, as medieval now because it's, it's been tied up in knots, it's not working. Uh, so what, why is that? And I think there's a fundamental reason because there's a breakdown in trust between members. If you don't trust, each other, then it's very hard to build consensus. And that is a fundamental missing, whether it's between the large members, uh, large economies, whether it's between the least developed and developing countries and the more developed countries, there's a lack of trust. And I think that for the WTO and the consensus system to function, we need to get at fundamentally what is wrong. It's not going to be easy. Building back trust is not something you talk about. You have to do it. You have to find those actions that will knit people together. And I do believe they exist. I'm a bit of an optimist about this. And I think we should try and repair the consensus system uh, uh, and make it work the way it used to. Thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, we've got time for only one final question. And I'd like to ask um, Pauline Otti, uh, if you'd like to put your question, please. Pauline, can you speak? Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, there's a question now, it's not on the screen. Can I have a question back on the screen? Uh, well, uh, yes, so I can read it for you if you right. like. Um, or, or if you could read it for me, that would be wonderful. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, you... hi, Ngozi, good luck. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Pauline's question, if you are elected, are you likely to promote the issue of debt service reduction and fair trading system to facilitate SDG 7 in the African region. So I think it's not a question about debt service reaction, but it's also how you see the role of WTO Director General more, more broadly. Is it just really? about trade or do you, see, do you see the role as being about the broader multilateral economic system? Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, the role of the WTO uh, DG is not one of direct, uh, it's through influence. Uh, I, but I, it's what I call soft power. And sometimes soft power can work very powerfully. So I, but you know, it, I intend if I'm elected to use it very proactively. And, mm -hmm. and uh, what you are getting at for me uh, in your question, Pauline, is what is the purpose? For me, it goes towards the purpose of the WTO. And in my speech, I said, I want a WTO with purpose. And that purpose is to improve the lives of people, improve living standards, deliver on the SDGs. Mm -hmm. So yes, very much so. Uh, I, 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 I see the, that trade 
is not a me is not an end in itself is a means to an end so it should enable us to contribute and in fact if you look at the fisheries negotiations and the what is happening there is also contributing to part of the SDGs and dealing with biodiversity. So uh, I would be that kind of DG that is proactive, that uh, tries to work with other institutions to deliver on some of the developmental issues. So yes, Creon, uh, I would not just, I would try to see the intersection of trade and the WTO with what other institutions can deliver on investment facilitation, for instance. Uh, 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 that is one clear area where there can be an intersection. On digital, I think working with other institutions would also be important. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, but I would like to thank all our questioners. I didn't do a terribly good job. There are many questions still to be answered, but I'm sure that there will be other opportunities. Um, and uh, Dr. Ngozi, thank you so much for spending the time with us today and for giving your very frank and clear answers. And I'm sure all of us would like to wish you well in the future process. So thank you very much for, for being with Chatham House today. Well, thank you very much, Creon. Thanks to Chatham House and a shout out to everybody who is listening. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.